Hello, this is Dr. Joel B. Gooden with Driven to Doctorate. Today I have a wonderful guest, Dr. Carrie Gillenwater. How are you, Carrie? Doing well. Thanks for having me, Joel. Appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you for coming on the show. Um, and um, today, I, I think it's just sort of a get to know you. Um, so I wanted to start with with sort of what are you doing now? You work okay. at North Central? I do. I work at North Central University uh, in the School of Education. I just uh, received promotion to full professor just really? a few days ago. Yeah, right. so that was exciting. Thanks. So that was great. Uh, primarily, I'm a dissertation chair, but I do teach uh, some courses as well, including the advanced qualitative research course. So yeah, been with North Central. Goodness gracious. Uh, at least seven years, I think. <laughs> Six wow. or seven, something like that. So, yeah. Yeah. I just got promoted to associate. So congratulations. Uh, yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, so so I'm I'm in there with you celebrating, but full is definitely what we all go for. Um and It'll come. <laughs> yeah, it's um yeah. So so that's that's awesome. Um, um so you're a full professor, you teach some courses, qualitative sort of emphasis. Yeah. Um, so let's let's go back in time. Uh, if only we could. But um, <laughs> uh, tell me, if you will, anything you can about where where were you born, where did you grow up, and then sure. how did you progressively get to where you are now? Okay, no, no worries. That's a that is a bit of a long and convoluted road, but I will tell you. <laughs> so I was uh, born in Jacksonville, North Carolina on the coast. Uh, most people associate that with Camp Lejeune and Marines, but no one in my entire family that I've ever known was a Marine. Uh, my grandfather moved out there to build the base and that's where he stayed back in good uh, 1950s. And uh, a late, uh, sorry, 1940s, my apologies. Anyway, um, yeah, so then, but my parents moved to Greensboro, North Carolina, where I was actually raised around the time I was two years old. Grew up there, um, did pretty well as a student after some, uh, some of my mom kicking me on my butt a few times to get it together. About around sixth grade, I pulled it together, started becoming a decent student, uh, learned to enjoy school and all that stuff. Um, but I uh, did not go to college uh, for, uh, to become a teacher. So I did not go to college to become a teacher. I went to college not knowing what I wanted to be, honestly, like a lot of us. Uh, but I went to University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill um, and figured out I wanted to make uh, movies. So I uh, did that, uh, graduated with a degree in film, uh, moved out to Los Angeles and through some connections, I uh, I uh, ended up working in television and movies, and that was a lot of fun back, especially when you're in your early 20s uh, doing that in L.A. And I worked on some TV shows like uh, some kid, a kid show named called Dragon Tales, a movie called The Curve, um, a TV show called Black Scorpion. But probably the most uh, famous people would know is The Nanny and then Family Guy. Um, that was the two biggest shows I worked on. And I also worked for Stan Lee, the guy who created Spider-Man, Fantastic Four, all this stuff we see in the movies nowadays. I worked for him and his company called Stan Lee Media. But I uh, ended up uh, moving out of Los Angeles and I uh, found myself looking around for work and stumbled into the NC lateral entry program for people who have degrees and want to be teachers but did not get trained to be teachers. Did that crash course during the summer of uh, 2000, 2000, I believe, and uh, then uh, went on, no, 2001, I'm sorry, summer 2001, and uh, went on to become a middle school language arts teacher. Uh, did that for about uh, five years, earned my master's during that, University of North Carolina Chapel, only people who would take me, and uh, then I went on into the PhD program, and I was a bit of an oddball um, I always wanted to teach, which at uh, University of North Carolina is a, which is a tier one research institute. Uh, mm -hmm. That is a little bit of a bizarre thing to say that you want to actually go back in the classroom and not hunker down in some, some room somewhere and start, uh, you know, doing research. But uh, I do like doing research. I do do it. 
but it's not it's not what drives me uh teaching and the students are what drive me so yeah um we so obviously to do that i we obviously moved out of los angeles back to north carolina lived in north carolina for many years got my phd 2012 i think and uh an education focused on media literacy media education um and teacher education obviously anyway uh not too long after that we uh decided to leave america and then and we moved to amsterdam in the netherlands what most people call holland and here is where we have lived for going on almost eight years now uh raised two kids here their two kids were five and three when we moved here and they've been raised in the dutch school system and speak dutch and we also had a third child while here and he is now almost four and going into uh, dutch public school in uh, about a week <laughs> oh wow so so that's that's my journey in your a journey's <laughs> interesting uh thanks not everybody's doing family guy and not everybody's <laughs> moving to holland yeah. so um no, that's can I say one thing? My, one of the funny things, a little oh, funny trivia piece about me is that you can go to imdb.com, type in my name, and I am in imdb.com. Yeah, <laughs> so, nice. That's pretty wild. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. Different uh, life, man. Different life. <laughs> yeah, this is very different. Um, and so you're you're out of one field and um uh, yeah, that's it's a many less celebrities here. Yes. Well, um, you know, one thing I didn't say, what motivated me to be honest to go into teaching was my experience in Los Angeles, honestly. Mm -hmm. I saw a lot of disparity, you know, uh, social, you know, economic type of situations, racism, a lot, a lot of a lot of hard stuff. You would think growing up in North Carolina, I would have been uh, more privy to <laughs> some of that stuff. But, you know, a kid, everything seemed fine. Uh, I know not everything is fine. But in Los Angeles, it was really just out in the open, you know, and I thought, man, uh, I want to do something to help. Um, I'm sure never going to be rich enough, even though I worked in Hollywood, <laughs> I was never going to be, uh, the, you know that level so even though i was having a good time so i thought man well once i got back to north carolina kind of poking around i thought well what about teaching you know that that could help and that's that's what led me to it really so yeah. cool cool yeah it seems like la um you know the the stories are that like the there's a lot of homeless on the streets and mm -hmm on the was, sidewalks and then yeah. you've got red carpet people sort of walking past them and <laughs> right on it's right gotta be a weird on them. <laughs> yeah i was telling a story to a buddy who i was hanging out with uh recently and i he had been to los angeles for a few days and was talking about homelessness and i remember i worked for this uh, company and uh they were down in south central los angeles pretty rough part of town back in the late 90s it probably still is um but, uh, you know, uh, they needed me to run some film over to this, uh, this building that was a few blocks away. So I hopped in my car, started driving over there, uh, started realizing that the further I went, the more abandoned the buildings were. They were just empty, you know, mm -hmm. boards and stuff. And then I started seeing just like lines of homeless people on the sidewalk, like sleeping, like camping out and stuff. I mean, more than I'd ever seen. And that, you know we all know the concept of skid row and that is actually come to find out where I was. So, but then I went another block down to deliver this film stuff. And here is this building, you know, looks great, beautiful BMWs, Mercedes, just beautiful top of the line cars parked all the way out in front of it. You know, and I was just like, wow, wow. You know? Yeah. So it's just, it was astounding, man. It's something I'd never seen really before. So <laughs> oh, it's good that you noticed. I think a lot yeah. of people don't notice. No, um, yeah, true. I imagine. But so you got out of that and, and now you're doing this and, and uh, making pennies, uh, <laughs> perhaps compared doing to doing the right you, thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I'm done. <laughs> 
I was never a person to argue for my salary. So I found out oftentimes, even in LA, I was making less than the same people doing the same job. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you got to. I was not, you know, when you're, you know, 21, 22, you, and they tell you you're going to make this, you're like, whoa, 30,000 a year. That's more than I've ever made. Woohoo. <laughs> you know? Yeah, for anybody watching, you have to negotiate your salary. That's right. Uh, sometimes they won't. Like North shoot Central. for the stars. <laughs> North Central, for instance, at the time I, I started, would not negotiate. So mm -hmm. it was like, we're not going to do that with you. But most places will. You can add an extra five, mm -hmm. ten thousand. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I probably shouldn't tell you this because people could look it up. Maybe you can edit it out. My brother, <laughs> he just goes into a new job and they're like, well, what do you think? Your, what would you like as your salary? And he just asked for like ridiculous amounts. And then they're like, well, that's a bit much. And then he's like, well, I feel like, you know, I can do this and I, you know, I'm worth it. And then they're like, it's still a bit much. So how about this? And then they lower it, but it's always still like decent. <laughs> so, you right. know, I mean, don't roll up in some job and ask for, you know, like 500,000 a year, if it's not a job that's ever going to pay that, but you know, <laughs> I really thought that was pretty pretty spectacular <laughs> uh, during the face technique right um, yeah yeah that sounds good yeah it was impressive <laughs> during the face is uh for anybody watching it's when you ask for way too much at the beginning and then you have to negotiate down and you you still end up getting what you more than you preferred or at least what you preferred because you're asking for less and it looks comparably less so it's more attractive to whoever you're persuading right. that um, technique is used in the film industry too with getting a rating you know, oh really directors will cram their movies full of like violence and stuff knowing that they're going to get asked to cut a lot of that out and they already had planned to anyway so i think uh probably some of the most famous people i've heard do it is martin scorsese and quentin tarantino so Huh. Yeah, <laughs> I, I I saw there was a guy uh, collecting donations for something yesterday. Um, I didn't have any change on me, but I was like, "Oh, here's the penny, uh, even a penny technique. You should you should use that." Um, <laughs> okay, and which is you know even a penny would help if you just donate a penny. Usually, people are too uh, ashamed to donate only a penny. Or to reject giving a only a penny, okay. so they'll give a dollar. You know, of course, it's a little different now that people don't carry as much change. Yeah, that's tough, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But he would. He looked at me like, um, "Why? Why are you telling me this? I'm not interested." You know. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, "Well, you could get a lot more donations." I didn't. <laughs> I didn't bother. But um. Yeah. No worries. Yeah, but I uh, I grew up on that. Um, undergrad social psych sort of emphasis um not all of us were were making family guy with you <laughs> um yeah, that, was, that was that was a fun fun part lucky part of my life there's more to the story I, it is really all about who you know so yeah no that's, <laughs> yeah. that's fantastic and i got lucky <laughs> so um obviously the point of this show is is to get to know you a little bit but also um i wanted to um sort of bring in um, some topics maybe that you could share about. There's there's always a lot of sort of uncertainty that students have when they're entering a dissertation or uncertainty that chairs have as they change from one university to the next. How do we see this? How do we, how do we view this? And um, where, are there any sort of areas that you feel like, oh, I can, I can say a few things about that? Sure. Um, I think one basic thing to always keep in mind, especially if, uh, you know, uh, scholarly writing is a, is a different beast, right? It's, it's not persuasive writing. It's not argumentative. I guess that's about the same. It's not expositional writing, right? It's not nonfiction writing. It's not, obviously, it's not fiction writing. You know, there, it's different. So it takes some getting used to. But, you know, if you know, if you're aware of your writing and you know you struggle a bit here or there or even a lot, you know, NCU has a lot of resources, and when your chair or even your professor in a course recommends you use them, use them. You know, don't be ashamed. I mean, 
we all, even, even us, we all have our writing quirks and habits and mistakes we make, you know, and uh, we need our work reviewed too. You know, we just, I just had an article published a couple of months back with some colleagues, you know, but we all had to put our work out there and all of us had to proofread it and edit it. And then it got sent to the journal, you know, uh, <laughs> we're all used to it, you know, so that's kind of a fundamental thing. I kind of like to talk to students when they come into the prospectus course about a few, a few, you know, maybe a step up from fundamental things. So for example, like a problem versus a purpose, you know, like a problem is just a problem. It's just something that you can empirically observe, I guess. You can, if your car has a flat tire, you can go outside and see it does. If you're my neighbor, I can say, Joe, is my tire flat? And you're going to be like, your tire's flat right? Now, once that conversation starts edging into or going straight into, I need to fix that tire. Why is my tire flat? What happened? All of that stuff is a purpose. That is a purpose. A purpose is an actionable item, right? It's got an action verb in it. You're going to do something, find out something, right? Mm -hmm. But the heart of it is the problem, which is the tire's flat, you know? And the, and the problem is the core of your work. It's the core of your dissertation, right? It's the core of your topic. It's the core of your dissertation. It's what drives your methodology, your design. It's what, you know, it's informed, hopefully, by your theoretical or conceptual framework, all of these things, right, that you've probably heard a million times. But these are really key critical items to understand. Um, and I, I've put that out there on the commons a few times. I've, you know, and I, I found that, that that simple analogy is not meant to be facetious. It's meant to be helpful, you know? And, uh, and so, and I, and I like that example. And, and of course it makes it simple, but I think that's all right. Because I do feel like we tend to have a habit in an academia of making some things that are just simple, more difficult than they need to be. Uh, that's my, my two cents, my not so humble opinion. Sorry for our beagle. The guest star yeah. eagle. Yeah, yeah. No, I use um, the house on fire. I, I just make up metaphors. Yeah, I, I mean, metaphors I think yours work. is much more peaceful than uh, a house on fire. I'm, what? Tell me I'm your house on fire. Traumatizing people. You know, the problem <laughs> yeah. is the house is on fire. Oh yeah. Well, okay. <laughs> so we might that. need to assess it or put it out. Who knows? Or at least get out of the house. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mine's not as a very violent example. Yeah. You never know, though. Somebody might have had a bad experience with a flat tire on a highway. Yeah, <laughs> you just Maybe. never know, right? <laughs> you never know what might happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say the other thing I like to talk about recently is theoretical versus conceptual frameworks. You know, the idea of a framework. If you're going to build a barn, you build a frame. If you're going to build a house, you build a frame, right? Like you frame these things, right? You know, you don't go buy all the furniture, put it all together, organize it, and then build a house around it typically. <laughs> I mean, maybe somebody does, but, you know, so the framework really should be the driving idea. You know, it's the driving, uh, the way you view the world in a way drives the framework, right? So whatever your positionality is. But, you know, a theory is something that is a theory. It's an idea. It's been, it's withstood, hopefully, the test of time for the most part. That's the idea behind the theory, right, in the quote-unquote hard sciences community. A theory is always there to be disproven, right? So a lot of people tend to have a habit of saying this theory proves, but that's actually erroneous. So the idea is a theory can only be as good as it, as it is until it's disproven. E equals MC squared. They're always trying to disprove that, right, so far mostly it's held up now i'm not an astrophysicist so <laughs> i can't get any further than that but uh i'm just you know an educator but uh you know but then so okay but theory is not really something that you might apply in a practical setting so that's what a conceptual framework is a concept is an idea based in theory that can be applied to a practical setting so, you know, you might look at uh, in education, you might look at social learning theory, and that could be the theory that sort of drives your study if you're coming at it from a theoretical standpoint. But if you're not, and you're more applied, you're looking at a problem in practice, as we call it, uh, then you might uh, use scaffolding, 
right? Uh, stuff like that. Uh, zone of proximal development. These kinds of things are theoretically based for their concepts that can be applied, you know. And so that's 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 another thing I like to talk about with students. I'm working on actually with Dr. Brian Allen. He and I are developing some materials and working on this idea to kind of flesh it out because it's a real it's a real challenging point for uh, for students. And I understand, like you know. I think some of the universities even are are a little bit um, uh, inconsistent about applying those terms. I yeah, you know, you're right. At um, I've taught at Walden as well, and I think there it was more of a if you were doing a PhD, it's you know there there's a few different viewpoints on that. I've seen like if you're doing a PhD. It's a theoretical framework. If you're doing an EDD or something like that, it's a conceptual framework. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I agree with that. Yeah. But, we kind I, of have I, that distinction here too, uh, but I think it's right. just to make it clear. But I agree with you, you know? And in reality, I feel like in reality, most students, EDD or PhD, especially in education, tend to look at practical problems, you right. know? Uh, so yeah, that, that's a good point though. Mm. Well, I guess the at the end of the day, you do what your chair says to some extent, and, <laughs> well, and move true. on with your life. But um, yeah, that's another that's another practical fundamental piece. Is the chair's revisions are not to drive you crazy. They're not personal. They are to challenge you, to make you better, to get you to your goal, which is a, a doctoral degree, right? I mean, that is what they exist for now. I'm sure, we can always maybe adopt a better tone sometimes in our in our feedback, but uh, you know the the underlying uh, the underlying force is love, right? Is the desire to get you there. We want you to be successful, you know, and uh, and so that's a good point. <laughs> but yeah, li listen to your chair. If you don't, if you disagree, that's fine, right? You know. That's fine, but it's always best to have a discussion. You know, even if it's in the comments, you reply to the comment, the chair replies to the comment. You know, if you ain't got time to meet on the phone or whatever, mm -hmm. or Zoom or where, however you want to meet nowadays. You know, there's multiple ways. <laughs> and part of that dialogue you can have when you, if you disagree with your chair on whatever it is, sometimes they're just helping you sort of clarify and and truly know what you're saying before before the paper moves forward that's good yeah that's true um and so that process is really what the dissertation is about it's it's mm -hmm. thinking critically and writing critically and and truly knowing what you're talking about and having those conversations is yeah. actually the yeah, very powerful mm -hmm. instead of just like oh he agrees or she agrees or they agree whatever it is, um, a little bit of, I'd say conflict or whatever word you want to use, mm. sort of pushing back and sort of trying to understand each other yeah. is healthy. Um, I agree. And students shouldn't be, shouldn't be scared by that. Um, they, you, can, you can be professional and say, I, I, I'm not sure I get it. I don't yeah. understand. Mm. Um, I understand chairs can be intimidating, but here's a, here's a fact. This is a hard fact. We don't know everything. <laughs> like we as chairs don't know everything, right? And I think you need and people need to understand that, you know, we do know a good amount and we know about the dissertation, right? Right. Maybe their topic is not in our wheelhouse to some degree or other. We're interested in it. We're learning some things along the way, you know. But yeah, and I think that's actually important because if we're reading it and have a question in our head, I don't get that, or how does that connect? then other readers are going to have that too. Right. And the goal is for the student, the, the doctoral candidate, to become the expert, right, on the topic. You may start out as, the, as somewhat of an expert, and as you read and get more literature under you and you begin to kind of think on these ideas, that grows. And as you write about it, of course, it grows some more. And, uh, but yeah, and, and you even may become more of an expert on how to do a dissertation, but that's where we come in, right? That's, that's the chair's job is to be that expert on how to work, how to do the dissertation, how to be successful, you know, how to 
fill in anything that maybe is missing, you know, um, challenge you on some ideas and stuff like that. Yeah. But I think it's important for students to know that, you know, we're not the expert on every topic. That's impossible, you know, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and so we're, we, we can, we're open, you know, that's what I'm saying. So intimate, I can, I know some of us can be intimidating, but. Sometimes we pretend to know, even though we don't. <laughs> We don't want to be. I, I've, I've I've learned that lesson. I, I just say, look, I don't know. I don't know. But I'll find out, you know, because right. you and neither one of us seem to know. So <laughs> I'm going to go over here and I'm going to ask somebody I think that knows. And you go over there and you ask the library or something, you know, I'm going to I'm going to ask a colleague who I know, you know, might know more about this idea, you know, so. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm, I, you know, I'm not people who don't, that's fine. That's just how I've grown to be. That's just how I've become. I'm just like, yep. oh, yeah. <laughs> I think that's most prominent normally in terms of like chapter two, that's going to be true for about every student. Um, I, I think when I was a doctoral student, I had this sort of weird misconception or paranoia, whatever we want to call it, that like somebody would know if I hadn't really read the original source, if I was, <laughs> or somebody would know if I had used a secondary source and sort of cut a corner or hadn't cited something exactly properly. Mm -hmm. And the truth is like, I don't, I don't know how many, how many of the articles in your students chapter twos do you go read? and say <laughs> oh you didn't you didn't paraphrase that very well mm -hmm. uh, I, well, I, I well I, I do use some techniques to sort of help with that I mean right. now you know if I will go look in an article if I feel like I really need to like but there's there's signals right uh sentences are going along and then something seems to contradict something but it's right. written in a way that suggests that it's not meant to right it's like okay what's going on here you know um and then, you know, or um, what we call voice, the voice changes, right? right? You're reading along and you've read enough of the student's stuff at some point where you're reading along and you're like, that does not sound like this person, right? Mm -hmm. You know, quick Google with a cut and pay, copy paste, you know, and sometimes you get a, a ding, you know, and you just say, hey, this needs to be paraphrased better, you know, or. I, I try not to allow any quotes from scholars and, and dissertations and because I want to hear their voice, not other scholars. But yeah, little techniques like that, you know, so I mean, I've, I've checked articles before when I'm reading a paragraph right. or a section and I'm like, I, I just don't quite get what's going on here. Like, you know, and I, I, it's written clearly, but I don't I'm, I'm either I don't un quite understand what they're saying, you know. And of course, you jump over to the library, you find the article, you read the abstract, you look at the introduction, you scan through some things, you know, and you look at the conclusions and, and you know, you can you can piece it together, you know, but, uh, but yeah, so those are just some some techniques, you know, of course, uh, yeah, uh, there's not enough time in the day to read every single article, obviously. So, uh, yeah, that's sort of what I'm trying to say. Obviously, they can students can take advantage of it inappropriately, but. We're, we're probably going to, it's just easy, I think, normally as a professor, if you're really good at it, then you're probably paraphrasing really well and yeah, yeah. you're not doing anything sneaky. Yeah, but, no. but, you know, if it is too much matching content, then we're going to hear the difference in the tone, mm. the voice, um, mm. and, the, and the way the sentence structure is, things mm. like that. But I think for chapter two, I just tell them this is this is where you're building your um, expertise and you're mm. showing your competence. The first area for you to really prove your competence is chapter two, I think, um, I agree, because, I agree. because you're reading all this and you need to, a lot of students forget to, or they don't, they're not even encouraged enough to, to um, critique the articles. And mm. I tell them, you're telling all these people they're going to, anybody that reads your dissertation is going to read your review of all these articles and they're just going to take it for whatever you say, somewhat at face value. If they want to go look into it, they can. 
Um, you all right? My wife asked him how long. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no worries. I, I was going to, but to, to the other point you made though, you're right about that. But the other point, um, but, but there might be that reader though, that's like, this doesn't sound right to me. Right. And that's us really. That's we're that reader. We're the reader reader with the critical lens. Right. Mm -hmm. We're the ones who say that sounds strange or that does not work together. You know, I mean, that's, that's the approach I try to take, you know, it, it, I know it's critical, but that's the deal. Right. Uh, but to, to point, to speak to the secondary versus primary source, that is a harder one. However, you know, to a degree, we're all pretty well read, at least in our area and have read enough dissertations at this point, you know, you get a lot of the same themes and dissertations. So, you know, like, okay, this is not, I mean, you don't always catch it, but I feel like I'm pretty good at knowing like, okay, wait, I know this is not this source, you know, um, but, you know, students sort of give themselves away. And I'm not going to say any more about that because I don't want them to, to stop giving themselves away on it. But, <laughs> but all of these are easy fixes. Everybody's taken a bunch of notes on articles in their lives. And now with technology, you read an article, you highlight it, maybe even cut, copy, paste like a sentence. And you're like, that was a great, great bit of information. I really, that really kind of summed up what they were saying there. And I'm going to, I'm going to, when I, when I use that information, I'm going to stick it in there for right now. And then I'll paraphrase it or I'll work around it and it'll, it'll get done. Sometimes you don't, <laughs> you know, right. so always give people the benefit of the doubt, you know, exactly. And secondary yeah. sources, or you just like, go read the primary source, just go read it. <laughs> like, unless you can't find it, you know, if it's in a different language or something like that. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, I incite the primary source. Yeah. Um, if you can't and you have to cite the secondary source, well, APA has a way to do that. <laughs> right. Know? So try right. not to. <laughs> We're not so concerned with, with plagiarism or academic integrity. We are concerned with it, but yeah, at this level, it's not like a course where we're going to usually, I've never sent any dissertating student for academic integrity violation, it, it's more of, hey, yeah. fix this and fix we this. move on. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's much more of a much more of a journey process, and that's that's one of the pros of the dissertation versus the course. I think I agree. That's amazing because I was just talking to a student about about that this week. I was telling her she's in the advanced qualitative course and the signature assignment, right? And I was telling her I was like. So here's the difference though. Soon you're gonna be working on your dissertation. Mm -hmm. And this stuff that you're writing now might be useful in that hopefully, right? But right now, when I review it and I critique it, I always tell them I review their work in courses through a dissertation chair's eyes, right? So I'm always marking up stuff and saying, you'll need to fix this, revise this or whatever, you know? Because even though they're not going to do it for the course more than likely, unless I always let students who have made a C or below do it. But if they make a B or A, they're not going to redo it right now. It's for them down the road. But I, can't, I told her, you know, I was like, you know, the difference here is right now on come Thursday, I'm going to give you a grade on this, you know, and that's the grade. And, you know, there you go. But, you know, next in the dissertation course, that's not going to be a thing anymore. You know, you're going to have the ability to revise and, you know, and I, that is a big difference, you know, um, Huge. I hope, I hope yeah. students appreciate that where I went to graduate school, they had this very bizarre, like it wasn't even letter grades. It was like H H P and all these other, and, and really they would never tell you exactly what they meant. Like, you know, like, so nobody really ever knew you, you, you gathered, if you got an H you did quite good right like an h hp we always said it meant high pass or whatever anyway so but th th that's something that is a bit frustrating is that the grades students are so attached to the grade and the value that the grade speaks they feel like it speaks to their personal value you know that's a a difficult way to learn though right you know it, we're all trained in that manner of learning you know uh we get evaluated even obviously, you know, but, right. uh, but, you know, it's, it's a hard, it, it, it's stifle, it can stifle learning. 
And that's what my point was to her is, you know, you're going to get in the dissertation. There's not going to be any more of this, you know, of course, we're going to grade you on, you know, did you complete the deliverables and stuff like that, but but that's a different scheme, right? So, uh, you know, you're going to find that you're going to be a little bit more free to, to explore. How could we change that about the courses? I have no idea. That's what people are used to, you know, it, it's, it works, you know, it's, it's, it's like a theory. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, <You know. laughs> I try to build in a few like my you know the milestones are when you finish chapter one when you finish chapter two or three or four or five um especially chapter five right but yeah. if if that's the only one we celebrate when you finish the whole thing um I think you need to sort of take stock of how far you've come along the way and so I have like certificates that that's I awesome. get digital certificates yeah. Yeah. They can print them out and frame them if they want, but you know, for you finish chapter one, good job. You finish chapter two, or even like if they go from I I was stuck, I didn't know what to write next. I was we I needed a meeting with you or Dr. Gillenwater, you know, and and finally I'm sort of I think I figured it out. I give them like an unstuck award, you know. I just <laughs> pick up award names; they're all yeah. official, and just like sort of celebrating all those like because they don't get that constant affirmation of like, you got an A or yeah. you got a B or, or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, so maybe that's like something that. we that's can nice. talk about. I know we plan to, or we had talked about um, bringing you back on the show and, and we're going to figure that out a little yeah. bit. Um, yeah, kind of, kind of uh, have a dialogue on certain things. Having and, some and ongoing like conversation. Yeah. yeah. The two of us and maybe even bring in guests, where the two of us could sort of have a uh, a three uh, three person discussion or something like that. Yeah, I like eventually. It. Yeah, that's so, gonna be cool. Yeah. Um, need to let you go because you're on a different time zone, and I think it's time to watch a movie with the kids. I think so. Yeah. Let's see what time is eight thirty p.m. here in good old Central Europe. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so. Well, well, hey, it's been a pleasure, man. Thank you so much. Thank you. This is uh, Dr. Joel B. Gooden with Driven to Doctorate. We had our guest, Dr. Kerry Gillenwater, today. Thank you so much, Kerry. Most welcome, man. Take it easy. Have a great weekend.